right. Well, welcome back to another uh, podcast. I'm here with Paul and Josh, and we are kicking off a new month, um, which means a new series for us. So, um, Paul, I know last time you gave us a hard time because we all had all of our drinks. Did you bring your big cup this time? I didn't. I'm sorry. I I forgot mine. What? Well, I got enough for everybody. Too bad we're not together. (laughs) Yay. Hey, there you go. There you go. I have an empty cup. Does that count for anything? (laughs) Oh, well, yes. Just pretend to drink out of it. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) All right. Well, our new series is called Go, and we are continuing sequentially in the story. So this is going to talk about the early church. Um, um, I'm really enjoying that we're kind of doing this sequentially. I like that we are kind of almost experiencing the story with, with the disciples, with Jesus, with, um, with them as it happens. I feel like that has been so interesting to me. But this month, we'll just kind of look at what does it really look like to share the gospel? What, what are we supposed to be doing? Um, how does God equip us? And what we can do when we encounter some obstacles or even opposition um, to that. I feel like we need some um, like Mission Impossible music playing for today because uh, we have, it's a not so secret mission we're going to talk about today. And your, your CD player, your phone, your laptop is not going to self-destruct after you hear this message. So you can feel free to rewind, listen back to it again. Um, Josh, do you want to kind of catch us up, catch us up to where we're at here in the story today? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, as Mara said, we're, uh, this is kind of sequential. And so we're just continuing the story from where we were last month. And so we, we went from, from Easter resurrection Sunday. And then the next Sunday we talked about, uh, doubting Thomas and, uh, and, and how he needed to see it to believe it. And then the, uh, the, um, the road to Emmaus and, and this is Jesus just kind of appearing after, uh, he's resurrected. And so this is kind of the, um, the last, uh, the last two Ra, the last part of the story of Jesus before he ascends into heaven. And so, um, so all of these things that happen now, uh, what's interesting is that there's, there's kind of different, uh, different, um, ways of telling the story based on the different gospels. John uh, leaves it out completely. Um, but, but the others are, uh, sometimes this is Jesus appearing to the disciples in the room around the table. Sometimes in Matthew, you'll see this happens uh, at the mountain. But at some point, uh, sometime after resurrection, uh, Jesus is appearing to his disciples and he's kind of going to give this last hoorah speech and this last, this is what you're going to do now. Uh, and so that's where we find ourselves now. All right, great. Yeah, so we are going to go ahead and use the text. It's out of uh, Matthew 28, uh, verses 16 through 19. Paul, do you mind reading that for us? Sure. Uh, this is Matthew 28, 16 through 19. Then the 11 disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. So there's that doubt word again. Then Jesus ca- came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you, and surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. All right, so I know that this is a familiar text to us, um, but as you kind of are reading it through again fresh, is anything popping out to you today? Any, any phrase, any, anything in there that um, is just kind of hitting your ears a little differently today? The, the doubt is there. That, that always sticks out to me when it talks about them doubting. And, and then Matthew makes a point of saying, then Jesus came to them. So, so you know, that, that it's kind of unclear what's going on here. They saw him, they worshiped him, they doubted, then Jesus came to them. Uh, you know, it, it's as if they're seating from a distance, but then he's drawing close. Um, so it's j- just interesting uh, the way this is phrased. And, you know, and the differences in the different texts, it's, it's, it's a fascinating, you'd like to be there to know exactly what was going on. Right. Yeah. It seems like there's definitely some space and some time maybe between these verses. And when we read them, it kind of, you, you lose that, it gets compressed. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. That and it's something that I, I don't think I really paid attention to or noticed too much uh, before this, but worshiped him. They worshiped him, but some doubted. Uh, I was actually just reading a little bit in, in some commentaries and, and there seems to be a suggestion that maybe the Greek to English way that that's translated here, where it seems that, you know, some of them were worshiping and some of them were doubting, 
uh, where there was some suggestion that maybe it's like it, it might be mistranslated there where it should be uh, they worshiped and doubted. Like, so it was kind of this not a separating into, you know, either you are worshiping or you're doubting, but some of your, so just, uh, again, just tying back to our, our Thomas discussion of this, this room for, for doubting, even while worshiping him uh, is, is pretty cool. I see Kobe that back there behind you. <laughs> yeah. Cameo appearance. <laughs> yeah, no, I love that. I don't honestly don't know that I'd ever really caught that a phrase about the doubt. And I think, yeah, just thinking back to all the stuff we've talked about, that is so interesting that that just, that theme pops up again. So yeah. let's kind of back up. Let's take an eagle eye approach to this. When we look through this passage, when we think about the church, like capital T, capital C, what, what is the mission? What is, what did he leave us to do? Make disciples, right? <laughs> Go and make disciples. Um, <laughs> Unpack that for us, Josh. What, yeah. what's a disciple? <laughs> I mean, that's what does it. that mean? <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so as I was, as I was thinking through this, um, I, I was, I think where my mind was going was this distinction of going to make disciples. And I think that maybe, and, and I don't know, we should, maybe we, this is where we would need David Smith in here to, to kind of uh, tell us the Greek and, and what it, what it's saying. But, but I think that a lot of times we have turned that into go and make conversions or make converts or make statistics. <laughs> um, and so uh, just that, the distinct, you know, that it's distinctly saying go and make disciples, I think is, is huge for us. And, and I don't know um, if we want to jump into that, you know, conversation now of the difference between a convert and a, a disciple. I just think, uh, I, I think sometimes we think, all right, look, we got to go, we got to make disciples. So we got to get that conversion. We can make a check mark and then we're done. But that's not this, this, I think there's difference here in, in what they're saying and go and make disciples. Um, I don't know if anybody else yeah. has any thoughts on that, but that stood out to me. And, and that's no, I agree with that. I feel like sometimes, yeah, we go and we want to get them to a crisis moment, but almost then we leave them in, in the chaos of, of what comes after that. Right. But, but I think when you're talking about making disciples it, it, that we do believe in conversion, we, 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 mm -hmm. we accept that there's a moment sure. of conversion, but discipleship begins before conversion. And so, yeah. you know, I, I always, when I think of discipleship, I think of, conversations jesus had uh you know all these disciples you, you know were they converted <laughs> you know it's a hard phrase to use when they started following him you, you know they didn't seem to get it uh, most of the time they were with him and so you know he, they were his disciples because they were listening and trying to follow and do those things so so i, I think that that when we when we make it conversion uh only then we're missing the opportunity to, to perform discipleship on all sorts of people and, and just kind of walk along with them and um, have conversations with people. Yeah. I wonder, so just, uh, just as you're saying that, I, this idea, well, I think we'll talk about this some, maybe a little bit later, but this going and making disciples, um, we kind of equate to this idea of missions and going. I wonder if there's just some correlation there um, because we, we think of, you know, we're doing mission work and we're going and then we're coming home. And so it kind of lends itself to that just um, conversion experience, but then pulling away with no discipleship. Um, whereas the, the discipleship is kind of this long-term um, nitty gritty. I don't know if there's any sort of, it just, I, just, I kind of thought about that as you were just saying that, but um, yeah, if we're just going, converting and then leaving, um, where's the discipleship in that? I don't know. Right. And that's the significance of the baptize in the middle of us. Ba baptism's about bringing people into community. And I mean, so that's a, that's yeah. a communal thing. Uh, you know, it's rebirth into a new community where teaching can take place. You know, there's, t there's teaching before someone in, in discipleship, but significant teaching happens uh, in the body of the church. Um, that, right. that, that there's formation that occurs there. And so you're, you're bringing these, these people uh, into the community and in the midst of the community, there, there's spiritual formation, there's life formation. And um, so, so I, yeah, I think they're, they're 
they're, the phrases aren't the same. <laughs> I, I think we roll them all up into yeah. one phrase, but it's, it's, I think there's a distinction and I think there's even a process uh, that's, that's present in that phrase. What do you think, Mara? Yeah, I was say, well, let's talk about that because it does seem like he's giving them a little bit of an order, a process here where like there's that making disciples stage, then there's the baptizing and then there's the teaching. And um, as I was thinking about this, I was um, wondering if we've, if we ever try to almost do that out of order where um, when we talk about teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you, if we try to start with that, and, and we think that that's how to make someone be a disciple. Like, I think that we can, we can easily get that out of order. Back to your point about the disciples, were they all converted? I don't know, but was that kind of that first step of them saying, hey, I want to learn. I want, I want to be taught. I want to be part of this community. Um, so um, I don't know. What do you think about that? Do we sometimes get that out of order? We do. And, and I think what you're seeing there, and, and you see it in the church, that, that people are taught the way to live as opposed to finding the way to live. <laughs> Maybe that's not a bit, good way to put it. So, so you know, I, I've been brought up in the church. Can, I can do Christian things without being mm-hmm. yeah. Christian because I, I mean, I, I, it's all I've ever known. It's my culture. And so that's, you create a culture Christianity as opposed mm-hmm. to a heart Christianity. So, so I think it's significant that the teaching occurs and we do, we, tr- we try to align people to the way we think Uh, before we align them to Jesus, (laughs) Uh, because we don't trust Jesus to align them to the way that we think. We're afraid that maybe they'll come in and have some different ideas, and we're so concerned that they'll they'll convert, and they won't think like us, and that's a scary thing. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Hmm. So, yeah, and that... uh just thinking about that, just that idea of making disciples at the very beginning of that. Like it's, it's just, I, I think we've been trained to, and I've been trained to think, you know, making a disciple is like the, after that, that conversion point or whatever, but it's like, man, yeah, I would love to know just <laughs> at what point does the discipleship process start? <laughs> um, I think it happens a, a whole lot, a, a long time before whatever we, we start truly follow or convert or whatever language you want to use there. Um, but yeah, that order is, that order is huge. Cause even the, even the baptizing, like, like you said, Paul, that's, that's baptizing them into the community, meaning that they fully belong even before that teaching that makes sense. What I'm saying, uh, I think that idea of, of the, the belonging, the baptizing into the community before before they th- before they start thinking fully like us <laughs> again that's not necessarily what we want but and i don't think anybody suggesting you don't teach before that there's not some level of that sure. but but i think there i think there's a different um there's something different going on once somebody said yeah this is the way i want to go and i'm gonna listen to the spirit i'm gonna listen to allow our community to form me uh, as opposed to somebody that's not part of your community you know you don't want somebody to be formed into the image of the community so they can fit into the community without at first somehow connecting to jesus because that's that's the point of this mm-hmm. hmm. yeah so, so there has to be buy-in right like and so right. in the in the baptism that's a kind of a both ways. Like it's the community accepting them, but also the person saying I'm buying into this community. Right. And so then I'm going to be teachable and moldable. And I don't know if moldable is a, a word or not. But <laughs> yeah. And so then I feel like that's kind of where maybe our obligation really begins with them. Once they have uh, decided to be a part of our community, they've made that, then that's really where like the teaching part um, and that that becomes really intense i'm kind of digging back into my education and it's like okay well direct instruction is where you are literally just telling someone something and that is often the least effective way to teach Um, the most effective way is through experience and through hands-on and and those kinds of things so um i think sometimes we see that we're teaching them to obey and we think that is telling them to obey what do you Am, am I off base there? Or what, what do you guys think? You there with me? Um, say it again. The difference, between, the difference between teaching them to obey or telling them to obey. Oh, that's good. Yeah. I mean, teaching, you're walking with them. Uh, telling, right. you're just saying, this is what you do. 
Uh, it's like, <laughs> you know, do, do what I say, not what I do. Uh, but when, yeah. when, you, when you're yeah. teaching, I think true teachers walk the way and not just talk the way. Yeah. I think it implies some, some self-discovering as well. Um, mm-hmm. Rather than me just, yeah, telling you this is the way. It's it's kind of walking alongside while they while they discover. It's good. Yeah, yeah. All right. So we kind of looked at so our, our mission overall, we kind of have this global mission. I love that this ties back even to like God talking to Abraham that like it was gonna be for the whole world. So I think I feel like when I read this in here, I hear that Jesus is telling them, like, don't keep this to yourself. It's time to spread it all over to all nations. And so I feel like that's kind of a really big mission that encompasses all, all of Christendom, all of us all over the world. How do we kind of take that into our local church, into us as individuals? And what, what part do we, should we be playing in this mission? Yeah. How do, how do we do it and still take care of our obligations? You know, we're, we're not, we're not called to send, we're called to go. And and too often we we think our um, our um, active mission is sending other people, uh, but Jesus doesn't go doesn't tell us send other people in the world to make disciples. He says go and make disciples. And so I don't think we can be satisfied with just sending. That's a good thing. It's good to financially support. It's good to to pray for missionaries. It's it's all those things are great things. Uh, you know, I've got a, a daughter-in-law that was a missionary kid, and so you know, I you have a, I have a heart for this, but but we have a mission field right here. Uh, you know, our closest mission fields up in our, um, our our upper sanctuary or the kids area, whatever we're called it, uh, that where our students gather. That's that's our closest missionary field. And, uh, you know, we need to see that as as a mission field, an opportunity to to go and make disciples. quiet time yeah it, <laughs> it's just I, I don't know this is what this is a because you you know this this ties to acts 1 8 you know the jerusalem judea samaria and all the ends of the earth and um i don't know i think it makes for interesting discussion is is this like are, is and i guess maybe this is the beauty of the body of christ where um you know because not everybody is going to go serve somewhere uh, overseas, like a missionary. Um, I think the one thing, though, that is maybe not up for, you know, that's someone else's call is the the most immediate mission field that we are, that we find ourselves in. Paul, like you said, the, the 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 kids, the teens, the next generation, regardless of what our calling is, you know, to go overseas, to go to another uh, town, another city, whatever, um, where we're at right now. Like, there's no no it's not negotiable that that is our, like our most immediate mission field. Um, I don't know. Right. It's good. So I guess I'm trying sitting here thinking like, why do you think it, it does seem like sometimes it's easier to almost do that financial support, that sending versus seeing the mission field here. Mm -hmm. It's a lot less messy. Yeah. It's a lot less messy. You don't have to live it. Uh, you don't have to experience it. Um, you know, if you give part of your income, and, and let's face it, usually we don't give until it hurts. We just give a little bit, uh, a little bit, maybe more than our tithe. And so it's, uh, it's never, it's never till it hurts. And um, so it's just easier. Makes us feel yeah. good. Right. Well, and on, like, I, I love being part of a church that has a global presence. I remember, um, and some of you listening are going to remember this too, there used to be this big board up that showed a map of the world and all the places that we had Nazarene churches. And I thought it was just so fascinating. Um, but then I also, there was part of me that I read this and it's like, make disciples of all nations. And um, sometimes I think, well, it almost is like of all nations but ours, like almost like we didn't, we didn't need missionaries here. We should, we just need to send yeah. them other places. And um, I don't know. Do you, do you think that that has, that that's true that we've kind of felt this call internationally, um, but not as much domestically. I, I think we're, we're um, there's, it's been corrected to a large degree. I don't know if it is in every church, but I think most churches have, have understood their, their requirement or their, their opportunity to disciple where they are, but there was definitely a time I think when it was out of balance. Um, you know, the one thing that's interesting to me is, you know, I've been several times on the the mission field, 
And every one of those churches has a foreign mission, a world's mission offering that they take. And, and so we, we tend to think, oh, that's just an American thing. Well, you go, you go to a, a church in the mountains in Guatemala, they'll have on the board how much they've raised for world missions. And so, so I think there's an awareness th throughout at least our denomination. You know, I don't know how other denominations work, but there's an awareness of the, of the global mission, but, but we've always got to keep the local mission uh, in, in, in the front of us. I wonder if there's some tie to kind of cultural, cultural Christianity, like you were talking about earlier, Paul, is we've just, we've been, we've made this, there's just such a tie between like American culture and Christianity. And so it's like, oh, well, you know, when we think of mission field, it's, uh, it's in places where there, it's, the culture isn't Christianity. And so I just wonder if there's a, a tie there, but, but I do think, Paul, that you're, you're right, that, uh, I think our denomination is a, is a big factor in that. Just the understanding in our whole denomination of, of world missions, world evangelism fund, that kind of thing. Uh, I think that's where that, that, that is helpful. Um, yeah. Yeah. And for anybody who's not aware, there is a portion of our budget. So when you tithe or you support our church, there is a portion of our, of our tithe that we take in that does go to that, those funds. And we even do some special offerings throughout the year. Many people get what we call faith promise. Uh, and so I, I, in my giving, every week I give my tithe. I, I give a portion towards world missions. I give a portion towards all in. And then I give a dollar every week to our alabaster because I don't want to keep my change. And so the <laughs> alabaster goes directly to build churches and schools and hospitals in foreign countries. And so, so yeah, that, uh, many people give just weekly, uh, regularly towards our global uh, responsibility. Yes. And it's always, I love hearing the stories and seeing the pictures of those places where we are. We have that global presence. We have those. Um, and um, I was kind of thinking as we were discussing this, what are maybe some of the, I don't want to say, I'm going to say less flashy, but hear me that like ways that we can participate in missions here because I think sometimes we we see something like Compassion International where you have the kids and those things that really are like emotion invoking um, and we maybe are missing some of the, the unseen mission fields around us. Um, Josh do you have I feel like you are a really good resource for some some of those unseen places. Yeah um, so I have the um, the perspective of coming from uh, inner city Columbus to Marysville. And this was, that was one of the, the big things, uh, for me was just when I'm in Columbus, um, you know, I walk out the door of the church and the, the need just, I mean, it just smacks you in the face. You, you walk out and you just see it. And so there's, uh, there's, I think there's definitely a, um, things like that is, okay. I'll just, it's, it's sexy, right? Like it's, it's sexy ministry because uh, it, it, you, it's such a, such a in your face need and, and you can just, you know, man, this is making a difference. Then you come, you know, I, I came to Marysville and it's, uh, and I think that some of the things are, are much more hidden and, and very, very much less visible. And so I think it does in order to, uh, to find those uh, less flashy mission opportunities, ministry opportunities in our backyard. I think that we do have to to do some deeper digging. Uh, we have to be kind of experts of our of our culture, of our community. Um, I think it requires a whole lot of communication. Um, we do have, you know, we have places like the Hope Center that are that are uh, face to face with um, with with the needs in our community. So just finding places like that. But I think really it's just it's kind of what our um, our philosophy or, or what we, we try to kind of teach is just being in our community, being visible in our community, uh, getting to know neighbors, uh, going to Friday nights uptowns and just see, I, I think that's, that's a big part of it is just being out there uh, listening. I think listening is key. Um, but yeah, it's definitely, it's definitely much more difficult to find those, um, those places because it's not as flashy. It's not as in your face as some places. All right. That's good. Yeah. I mean, the, and, and sometimes we can go to those places and we can, we can do the uh, parachute in and, and 
parachute back out <laughs> or jump back out, jump in, jump so out. Where it's not really a lifestyle where yeah. you think Jesus is inviting us to a discipleship lifestyle and a discipleship lifestyle would mean that on a day-to-day -day basis, I can disciple. And so that, that means, yeah, sure. You can go to inner city Columbus and, and we we're advocates for that. We believe in that. Yeah. Uh, but your your primary mission fields your neighborhood it's mm -hmm. it's where you go to work it's where you go to school it's uh yeah. where your kids play soccer and you know when we're in the public again <laughs> if, that, if we ever have <laughs> yeah. activities again <laughs> you guys are yeah you're going oh yeah i get my my primary mission fills my living room watching netflix yeah. and uh <laughs> <laughs> but, but yeah. those places that we because it's it's meant to be a lifestyle it's meant to be just how we live. Well, if yes. it's something that always has to be special and unique, and mm -hmm. then it yep. can't be a lifestyle. Uh, you know, yeah. it can be weekends or extra time. God wants us to be missionaries all the time. Yeah, which is so like this is what the incarnation of Christ is, right? Like that this mission wasn't accomplished from from heaven, right? Like the the, ma the message version of John one is that. Uh, Jesus took on flesh and moved into the neighborhood, <laughs> like uh, this, this idea of investing. And so is there, a, is there a place for those, those, you know, special events going? Absolutely. Um, but, and, and so this is um, for my teens, we, we take our, our be your kingdom here uh, mission trips. And this is, it, it kind of developed from my time in, in, uh, in Columbus and having other groups coming in, coming in and, and talking to them. And just this realization that, those who are permanently there, like in the midst of the neighborhood and in, in the, in the community, they're the ones who are doing the, the, the messy discipleship work. When we go there, we're just kind of lending a helping hand. Right. And so um, just, just figuring out what that, what that looks like. So how do we take their story of transformation and discipleship that they're doing in their neighborhood? How do we learn from that and take that back to our neighborhood Right. And, and also do that, that discipleship and, and transformational work. Um, and, and what I found about all those trips like that, that, that you do some good. I don't want people to think, oh, well, you don't do any good. But sure. the good that's done is more the spiritual formation of the person going. Yeah. Uh, they, they could take your money <laughs> and just use your money on those trips. Yeah. And probably use it more effectively than so you can true. with a group of teens or a group of anybody from a local church. But God, so I do believe that on those special trips, God can awaken us mm -hmm. to his move. And, and so if they're positive in that sure. way, as long as when you come back, you don't think, okay, I'll wait till next year or two years from now when I can have another trip, but you allow mm -hmm. God to activate that mission right. speed within you. Yeah. Which should shape the way that we, approach trips like that and, and experiences like that. Um, that's why I mean, cause I coordinated all the, the, the work and witness trips that came down for a weekend or a week. And, and it was, I'll tell you, it was a lot of work on, on the receiving end. Um, but yeah, time and time again, it was just that telling the story of God uh, that kind of lit something in, in, in folks. And so, so I think for our perspective of when we go, uh, I'm just remembering that perspective though, that, um, that we're just coming along. We're, I'm not coming in with the answers to show you how to do things. I'm coming in to kind of give you a helping hand and I want to learn from you. I think that that's a significant posture. So yeah. I feel like, yeah, I just went on a, a lot of tangents there probably. So <laughs> now I'm just sitting here and I'm like, can I tell you guys something? I have never been on what you might call a mission trip. Like I'm just sitting here thinking like, I've, I've never done work in witness. I've never, I've never gone and done those things. And so I'll, I'm like, man, all of a sudden I'm really, I'm really feeling left out here. Like I've like missed something in my like, per, like spiritual growth uh, formation. So, so maybe talk to somebody who hasn't gone on one of those. How can you, how can you still encourage that kind of growth, that kind of uh, a heart or a vision for missions when, when you haven't actually gone, you haven't well, left. The I think, I think you, you manifest that you have that spirit, but I do think you would enjoy it. I mean, I, I don't think that, I don't think you have to go on a work and witness trip to have a mission spirit. Uh, but, and you do, but I, I would 
strongly, I, I'd strongly recommend everybody in their lifetime to at least do one. Because <laughs> yeah. I think yeah. it's just, there's just something about them that you can't really, you can't duplicate. You just can't duplicate it any other way, but that yeah. time apart and um, you, you're separated from the reality and you're forced to focus on, okay, mission. Yeah. 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 yeah so I'd say to someone who's, you know, maybe considering going or wants to go at some point, uh, just the, just the idea, just remembering that you're, you're going into this, uh, in humility. I think that for a long time, we, we, we set it up as if the, the mission team was, were the experts <laughs> and taking it and taking their expertise into the mission field, which I think has just been, <laughs> it's been pretty detrimental, I think in, in places where that is, that is, that has happened. And so just remembering that, that again, they're the ones that have devoted their lives to this place, this community, this neighborhood. And so my role going in is to lend a helping hand if, it, if there's something I can do that is, that is helpful and not, not harmful. Um, but going in just honestly with the, with the attitude of we're just going to learn. And so again, I, I'm just plugging my, our, our youth group mission trips that, that, that we coordinate because uh, I, I tell my teens like, and, and in my communication with the organizations that we go to, um, we just want, we want to learn from you. We want to, we want to hear your story. We want to know what God's up to there. Uh, we want to hear about that. Uh, if there's something that we can do physically, some work of some sort that we can do, that's actually going to be helpful and not just, you know, painting walls for the 46th time, just so somebody has something to do, we'd be glad to do that. But if you just want to sit and tell your story about what God is doing in your community, then that's what we want to do too. And so then going in with an attitude of I'm here to learn, but then also an attitude of I'm going to take what I learned and I've got to learn how to translate that to my own culture. Cause I can't just duplicate what they're doing there in mm -hmm. my neighborhood because it's different. And so just those kind of principles that we might learn. Um, yeah, just, I would just go into these things like as a learner and that's, that's your job is being a learner. All the other stuff I think is secondary. And Josh, you said something that I think is really important. You said to see what God's up to there. Yeah. Never take God on the mission field. You meet mm -hmm. God. On yep, the that's exactly field. right. Yeah. And so I, I think it's significant that Jesus says in verse 20, I'm with you always to the very mm -hmm. end of the age. And that's connected with the mission uh, yeah. that, that we oftentimes think, well, if I stay in church, <laughs> and we never go outside these walls. I think oftentimes we miss the move of God because he's outside our walls moving yeah. and we're sitting in there waiting for him to gather with us. And he, yeah. he maybe he's saying, Hey, can you guys come out here for a while? There's yeah. some people I want you to minister to. Yeah. Come see what I'm up to for sure. Yeah. Yep. I love that. I caught that phrase too. And I'm like, I, I really like that. So yeah. um, kind of keeping in that idea, like what, what God's up to, let's talk a little bit maybe about, um, about our spheres of influence here and how we can, um, be a part and, and really be looking for what God's up to. I mean, I'm thinking like we've got our kids, our teens, our friends, our families. Um, how do we, how do we stay on mission in, in our, in our spheres of influence? What does that look like? I, I think it starts with just rubbing shoulders with people that aren't part of our, our church communities and our church groups, small groups, classes, things like that. Um, Personally, that's why I that's why I volunteer at the Hope Center every Thursday with a uh, open gym there um, because I I'm smack dab in the middle of you know 15 teenagers that would never step foot in my church and uh, and I and I develop relationships there. But I, yeah, I think it starts with just rubbing shoulders with people that aren't in our in our church. Yep. What do you think, Mara? Josh and I've talked a lot this time. <laughs> It's true. It's true. I'm learning a lot though. I like to hear you guys talk. Um, yeah, I was just kind of, I read a book about this a couple of years ago and it was talking about like, yeah, running on mission and what that looks like. And basically this idea that we all, um, like we've all been called to this mission. I think sometimes we have this idea that some people are called to ministry and others aren't. And, um, it was really eye opening for me just to, to hear that and be like that encouraged by the idea that we have, we're all, commissioned. I don't even know if we mentioned that this is called the great commission. This is, um, this is a mission that's been given to all of us. 
And um, so when we are, when we see ourselves as no matter what our job is, like we talk about vocational ministry and that you're getting, you're getting paid for doing this. But even if that's not your job, like that we all are in ministry, we're all, um, I liked, I think, Paul, you mentioned the word, um, every person is a missionary. Everybody is, has a mission. Everybody has people around them that they can be um, showing um, how to live a life of hope, how to f- follow Jesus. That's Reggie McNeil from Present Future recommends that churches move from every member of minister to every, minister, every member of missionary, um, which has positive implications and negative po- impl- implications as well. Uh, it, because sometimes we don't take care of the things we need to at the church when we're so focused outside the church and there's things that need to happen in the church. We, we, we need to see the church as a vehicle of mission. And you know, now we, we don't support the church just simply to support the church, but we believe that the church is this vehicle that God uses to accomplish his mission. And, you know, so there's training going on there. There's, there's encouragement going on there. There's discipleship that happens there. So, so the church, that local body that meets is an important thing, but it's not the only thing because if the local body is the only thing that meets and there's no other action that happens, then we become self-absorbed. Yeah. I like that phrase, like the vehicle of our mission. Cause I was also thinking, I mean, honestly, my um, my job has changed very much in the past few years. I went from being a teacher to now I'm yeah working at the church and working with the kids. But in that, like my mission didn't change. The right. vehicle for it did. The, yeah. the ways that I interact with people, yeah. um, it totally did. But when I look back, I was no less on mission when I was teaching than yeah. I than I am now if I'm truly doing these things. And um, so, I yeah, I thought that was just... An interesting thing that the vehicle of the mission may change, but like the mission itself doesn't. And we need to find ways to make the most of that. Yeah. I've driven a lot of different vehicles over the years. They've changed and uh, the church changes too. My favorite is still my El Camino. I wish I could another El Camino. I don't think I find them anymore. A car (laughs) and a truck. You know, oh, we have one of those parked around the corner from us. Oh, really? Oh, I'm, yeah, I'm pretty sure. I, I always wondered who drove those. Yeah. <laughs> it's Paul's. He just parked guys with mullets in the '80s. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so perfect. <laughs> Judah's telling us we need to wrap it up. I know. Yeah, he, there. This is our timer. He's like, "You guys are you guys are going too long there." <laughs> yeah. All right. All right. Well, we have just one more thing I just wanted to throw out here to talk about with you guys is that this mission was given to them, even in the midst of their doubts, kind of going back on what you said at the beginning, we all kind of mentioned that some of them were doubtful. Some of them are worshiping and doubtful. However you take it. um, He didn't look at their doubts and say, "Never mind, I'll find somebody else. Right. How is maybe our participation in this actually part of our growing in faith? Yeah. I, th- I think I, I love that. I'm glad that, that we're, uh, we're wrapping up with that because I think that that's huge too, is that this, this commission was given to all of them re- regardless of where they fell in that worship or doubt or both. Um, and so, uh, man, I think that this is, this is huge. And this kind of goes back to what, you know, my, my kind of encouragements of, of going into mission opportunities, whether they're local or further away uh, as a learning opportunity, as a, Again, seeing what God is up to in your local community, in another community, finding out what God is up to, and then learning how to uh, to kind of apply that to my life. Um, I think I think this is this is huge. You know, we can talk about the different aspects of discipleship and the different components of it, but I mean, if we're not participating in the mission, then I think we're we're missing a significant part of our our spiritual growth and formation. Yeah, that's good. That's good. Ditto. I agree. <laughs> Second that. <laughs> and let's just hang on to that promise at the end that he does say he is with us always. Right. So he's not sending us out on our own. He's not sending us out unequipped. Uh, we might not be able to see the ways that we are equipped, but, but he's yeah. promised to be with us to the very end of the age. So that yeah. includes all of us. Um, so as we kind of wrap up, let's talk a little bit about some specific applications. Um, we all minister kind of to different groups, but they all overlap and they all kind of grow together. Josh, um, as you think about your teens mm-hmm. and your parents of teens or people who still think like teenagers, what, what are yeah. you pulling from this today? <laughs> yeah, man, I think just the, what we're talking about, the different vehicles of, of mission, um, 
we're as we go through life in each stage, we're in different mission fields. And so whether you're junior high or you have a mission field in your middle school, uh, high schoolers, you have a, a mission field in your high school and those change over time. Um, you know, I, I just, just before this call, I do a, a Bible study with the seniors. And so talking with them and they're getting ready to um, make a big transition into even a, a new mission field. So I guess my encouragement would just be to, uh, to recognize every single place that you're at as a mission field. Uh, and, and that's obviously not just for our, our teens, that's for all of us. Um, whether it is at, at Kroger uh, trying to get groceries with masks on or, or whatever it is, uh, what would it look like to, to truly see every single scenario that we're in as a mission field? Um, and, uh, and that's not, I mean, if you, listen to this conversation, you, I don't think you'll get this, but it's not a, you know, go into every situation and be the, you know, the street corner preacher or whatever. Um, it's, it's just seeing, um, investing in, 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 so yeah, I would just encourage our teens, wherever you're at, if you, whenever you get to go back to school, uh, whenever you get to jump back on your sports team, whatever it is, what would it look like for, uh, for that to be uh, your, your mission field? That's good. That's good. I was thinking, um, talked about parents and kids. Um, I wanted to encourage parents this week that your kids, especially right now, I mean, we were spending a lot of time with them, but that is like your primary mission field. Um, I'm a firm believer that there's probably not a more valuable thing that you can do than invest in your kids. They they are the future of our church. They are the the future of our country. They are the future of this global mission. I mean, we are raising kids in our church right now that I absolutely believe with all my heart are going to take this mission and run with it. And some of them already are. They, it's, um, so I just encourage you like to think about, are, are you teaching your kids? Are you teaching them? Are you telling them? Are you living the kind of life? Are you modeling for your kids a lifestyle that, um, that shows them an authentic faith. We, we want to make sure our words are not empty, but that they are backed up by our actions. Um, and kids, I want to encourage you guys, you are included in this. We've talked before, there is not a junior version of the Great Commission. Yeah, right. It starts exactly like, like Josh was saying, it starts exactly where you are with your brothers and sisters, with your friends. It starts with you caring about other people, being kind, meeting a need that you see um, and you just, you're the, just willing to do whatever the next right thing is. Yeah. So, can right, I, Josh. Can I plug right, right there real quick? Uh, just yeah. so parents specifically, as Mara was saying that, I was just like, just, just a reminder that Mara and I both would love to help equip you and resource you in, uh, in those areas. And so if you're just like, man, I just don't know what to do uh, or I need help in this, uh, we would love to, not that we have the answers and we've got it figured out, but we, we are pretty familiar with a lot of different resources that are out there. And so we would love to, to help you find those and equip you with those and walk alongside you. Yes. And can I offer the flip side of that is that Josh and I are also raising little kids and some of you have a little more experience. So as you have been discipling your kids, <laughs> I want to yeah. hear it. I would like, yeah. yes, all the, all the advice, please. You guys have anything for dogs? Spencer's over there wrestling with Kobe getting. To- <laughs> <laughs> I just want to know why Spencer ignored me last night and didn't play 2k on Xbox with me. That's all I want to know. Sleep. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I would say just kind of in closing, this is a, this is a big mission and uh, you know, Jesus, these are just 11 nobodies. Hmm. in a mountain in Galilee, you know, this Galilee's not even like a center of Israel. It's like the outskirts. It's like going to, uh, <laughs> to, to Marysville, Ohio and saying, okay, you guys go change the world. And so I, I guess the re- reminder I'd give is a familiar phrase. God doesn't call the equipped. He equips the call. And so th- this message is not too big for us. This mission's not too big for us because God is on our side. And uh, if, if we'll allow him, he can, he can move to us. But um, Josh, why don't you close us out in prayer today, bud? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. God, thank you for this day. Uh, thank you for this conversation that we've had. Uh, thank you for giving us a mission. Thank you for allowing us to be a part of your mission. Uh, and uh, God, I pray that you would help us to, uh, to know, know what you would have us do, know what our mission is, um, to see every single interaction and scenario and environment that we are a part of. God, I pray that you would help us to see that as 
our mission field. So give us strength, help us to remember that as you promised in this passage that you go with us uh, as we go. We don't do this alone. We have you walking alongside us. So thank you for that encouragement. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.